like to welcome our keynote speaker, Jane Sauer, who, along with Sonia Clark, is one, was one of the drawers for Fiber Art International, a fiber artist known in part for her groundbreaking basket forms, Jane Sauer was at the forefront of the American art and craft movement. Having exhibited nationally and internationally for over 50 years, she has, has work in the collections of at least 24 museums in the United States and abroad, including the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Museum of Art and Design in New York, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. In 2001, she became artistic director of 13 Moons Gallery in Santa Fe, which she subsequently bought, changing the name to the Jane Sauer Gallery. In 2014, she sold the gallery and formed Sauer Art Consultants. Jane Sauer has served on the boards of numerous organizations, including the American Craft Council, the Craft Emergency Fund, the National Council for the School of Art at Washington University, and the advisory board of the University of Santa Fe. She's received numerous grants over the years, including two from the National Endowment for the Arts. Her resume is incredibly extensive and long, as you can imagine. She is part of the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. It's no surprise that Jane Sauer has received many, many awards for her work. She was awarded the Distinguished Alumni Award from Washington University in St. Louis. She is an honorary fellow of the American Craft Council. She is also the 2019 recipient of the National Basketry Organization's Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> Should I also tell them you have seven children? <laughs> The title of Jane Sauer's talk today is Crossing the Border, Craft and Art. Please welcome, warmly, Jane Sauer. I promised myself I would not digress, but that was before I came here, and I just have to stop for a moment and say I have never attended an event as wonderful as this. It is amazing. It, the, it, it, what it took to put this together and how I love the element of talking to the artist and talking to the artist about their work. And I just ask out of 56 artists, 32, did you tell me? 32 attended and are available to talk about their work. And I know we're supposed to just look at it and take in the artistic of it, but we're so many of us sitting in this room are makers, so we want to know, what did you use? <laughs> you know? So it, it, it's just open, and everybody that I talked to, when I said, what did you use, and what's this, and where'd you get this, we're totally open, no secrets. It was wonderful. So now I'm, I've digressed. <laughs> I have a limited amount of time and a lot to say, so I don't want to digress. I want to thank all the members of the Fiber Art International for giving me this opportunity to be a juror and to attend this exciting event and comment on this seminal exhibit that is totally amazing. <laughs> I've never worked with a more professional and skilled group of women in my many years of during shows like this. To the artists in the audience who are either have work in the show or who didn't make the cut, I want to explain how hard this jury process was. Sonia Clark and I struggled to whittle down the accepted pieces from so many excellent submissions. As big as this exhibit is, we could have easily had it be twice the size. And I think we requested that at some point even. <laughs> the large number of entries is really a testament to the high quality of this show and the value of Fiber Art International. Before I begin, I want to deeply apologize for any names that I mispronounce. It was a struggle. I tried to find 
proper pronunciation online, on YouTube, and I just couldn't do it. So I hope I'll do okay. Art farms using textiles have existed for millennia, but have not always been held in high esteem in the art world. It was during the Renaissance that the separation of art and craft became more apparent, and a division developed that saw fine art prized over the craft of weaving and stitching. The artificial divide that exists between fine art and textiles or craft tends to be a gendered issue. Textiles have historically suffered as an art media because of their association with domesticity and femininity. Formerly, art critics were exclusively men and they labeled work in fiber as women's work and dismissed them as inferior pursuits. It is obvious that there is a change taking place and textiles and textile techniques are being adopted by artists identified in the fine art world. The question of art versus craft is as old as I am. Is it still valid? In this talk, I'm going to show the work of artists who have managed to be viewed in the fine art world. I'm constantly trying to figure out why they are there and others who create equally valid and important work are considered part of the craft world. I will not pretend to have answers for you, but only raise questions. As you look at the work, I hope you too will ponder this issue. Is it how the artist positions him or herself? Is it simply the old age addict of being in the right place at the right time? Is it dedication to one's work over all else, ignoring that elusive thing called balance? Is it scale? Is it having enough financial backing to create massive projects what will, that will then draw more attention? Is it a burning passion that gives the work a strong voice? Sonia De Alane was the first living female artist to have her have a, a retrospective exhibition at the Louvre in 1964. Although a multimedia artist, Delane heavily used textiles in her artistic practice, including costume design, furniture painting, clothing design, and textiles that were sold worldwide. She states, I have always changed everything around me. I design my furniture and their covering and even my clothes. I have done everything. I lived my art. She even covered a car in a pattern to match the clothing she designed. <laughs> Her creativity extended to creating clothing with poetry as part of the design. It looks as contemporary today as I think it did then. In 2015, Tate Modern in London held a retrospective of her work, which gave equal attention to the work she did in textiles. Annie Albers became the first weaver to cross the imaginary border from craft to art when she became the first weaver to have a significant solo show at the Muse Museum of Modern Art in 1949. Nearly 70 years later, in 2018, Tate Modern, again, mounted a retrospective of Albers' work, showing over 350 objects, ranging from her geometric wall hangings to textiles for interiors and architecture, and her writings and drawings to supplement. Weavings for Albers offered a bridge to divide, to the divide between art and craft, not by opting for one in preference over the other, but in working with both in tandem, making abstract wall hangings that she saw as much artworks as the paintings of Clay and Kandinsky. Faith Ringel, mother, was a fashion designer, and her father was an avid storyteller. 
In 1950, she enrolled in City College of New York City, desiring to major in art, but was forced to major in education instead because City College only allowed women to enroll in certain majors. Although she is a multimedia artist, Ringgold is most known for her painted story quilts that combine visuals with written storytelling. The first quilts were a collaboration with her mother, Willie Posey, who taught faith to quilt in the African-American tradition, which she continued for the rest of her life. Her work has always been personal and deeply political. She has been an activist since the late 60s, and most of her work centers around issues of racism and feminism. And she has struggled with both issues, never afraid to let her voice be heard. In 1968, Ringgold and other artists, including Lucy Lepard, which some of you may know as a writer, protested against modernism, a major exhibit in modernism at the Whitney Museum of Art. Members of the protest committee demanded that women artists account for 50% of the exhibitors and created disturbances at the museum by singing, chanting, blowing whistles, and leaving raw eggs and sanitary napkins on the ground. <laughs> Not only were women excluded from this major exhibit, but there were no African American artists included either. Unfortunately, this sounds familiar today. <laughs> Sheila Hicks is a pioneering fiber artist that blurs the boundary between painting and sculpture with her vibrant woven works. Hicks states, I wanted to give textiles another status and show what an artist can do with these incredible materials. Her art relishes in sumptuous beauty, her keen sense of color, and her rich sense of texture. According to Hicks, living an honest, Mindful life requires a devotion to making, and by deprioritizing such slow skills, we lose opportunities for richness and beauty. Hicks learned to sew from her grandmother at an early age. Her use of domestic mediums differed radically from the rigid industrial techniques of the minimalist and hard edge abstract painters so prominent among her contemporaries. At 85, Hicks is still a vital and active artist. Her installation, es Escalade Beyond Chromatic Lands, which you're looking at, was in the Venice Biennale in 2017. While these large-scale projects are particularly visible, Hicks doesn't necessarily view them as the core of her practice. She has noted, at times, no one even has bothered to contact me when they remove a major work of mine from a building. They don't consult me or ask me if I'd like to have the piece back. Sometimes they get destroyed. In this way, smaller works tend to be more lasting. Hicks doesn't need a commission or a site to inspire her. She says, I work every single day. Like many textile artists, Cave began manipulating fabrics as a child. He states, when you're raised by a single mother with six brothers and lots of hand-me-downs, you have to figure out how to make those clothes your own. Today, Cave is widely known for his elaborate sound suits sculptural costumes that can be exhibited in a gallery or a museum and worn by dancers. Cave himself is an Alvin Ailey trained performer and is frequently one of the performers in his sound suits. Intended to move, these outfits are sewn together, never any glue is used, and create a sound like a musical instrument. An extension of his childhood experiments, cave suits are made from recycled materials like old handbags, dyed human hair, 
plastic buttons, twigs, feathers, doilies, and more. To date, CAVE has created 500 sound suits, which draw upon a variety of textile traditions, from Haitian voodoo flags to African ceremonial costumes, and range in tone from the playful to the political. Nito is a Brazilian conceptual artist whose installations are truly a sensory experience. His biomorphic farms are frequently filled with various objects like spices, sand, and shells. For me, mind and body are one thing, always together, the artist has said. I believe in the sensual body and it is through movement of such body-mind that we connect with all things in this world. In life, we touch the way we feel, the way we think, and the way we deal. His practice explores the boundaries of physical and social space through interactive, tactile, and organic structures. The work renegotiates the boundaries between the artwork and the viewer. El Anatsu. In lieu of fabric and threads, this Ghanaian artist, El Anatsu, creates monumental simmering tapestries out of folded liquor bottle caps and copper wire. The amazing thing about working with these metallic fabrics, Anatsu explains, is that the poverty of the materials used in no way precludes telling of a rich and wonderful story. While I abstract in composition, Anatsu's assemblages touch upon a wide array of narratives, from the stories of the consumers who purchased the bottles to the tale of Anatsu's early life in Ghana, watching family members weave traditional African kente cloths to the history of the alcohol distribution to the slave trade. Anatsu works with a team of about 30 assistants to methodically crush, link, and twist each bottle cap, eventually producing sculptures that can weave and bend like cloth. He embraces the element of chance in his work, encouraging exhibitors to hang, drape, and fold his textiles in whatever format they choose. Billy Zingwa, a South African artist who was raised in Botswana, derives her narratives from her own experiences, either mental, physical, or visceral. She is documenting personal history depicting herself, her son, and other loved ones doing everyday odd things. She states, telling my story is a kind of personal empowerment, taking charge of my own story and using my voice. She studied printmaking. When she graduated, she had no access to printing facilities and no studio. So she had to be creative if she wanted to continue being an artist. She found herself working in textiles. Her process is quite simple. She draws on newsprint paper, then pins the paper onto silk, cuts out the pieces and places them on a background of silk, finally hand sewing it all together. Silk was a natural for her since it is a material that is a byproduct of transformation. Azerbaijani artist Amid lives and works in his hometown of Baku, Azerbaijan. He is known for his hallucinogenic carpet kum sculptures that combine research into ancient weaving techniques and iconographic systems with more contemporary imagery. The resulting artworks appear to be the effect of a computer glitch where abstract farms seem to melt like liquid. Looking at them can sometimes make you feel like you've accidentally fallen into another dimension. Ahmed states, 
As any Azure family, we had carpets everywhere, on the floor, on the walls, in each room. I had a carpet in my room too. I was always playing with the patterns on the carpet, imagining that they were roads, trees, dragons. One day when my parents were out, I decided to change the places of the patterns and cut the carpet into pieces. <laughs> of course, I never managed to get all the pieces back together again. I was waiting for my parents to come and punish me, but they didn't. They just took the carpets away from my room. <laughs> and that really was the beginning of my art. Amid states, being an artist is not just a job or a profession. It's a lifestyle. Neither art education or studio work can make you an artist. You have to think as an artist and live a life as an artist to become one. Amid makes his sketches on a computer and then transfers them to special engineering paper dot by dot. After he passes his sketches to carpet makers, they weave the carpets in his hometown using all the ancient techniques of the region. All threads are wool or silk and dyed with natural colors. The process of weaving is exactly the same as it was 300 years ago. Pia Camille, in the spring of 2015, Mexican artist Camille made headlines by handing out 800 free ponchos at Freeze New York. Patched together from discarded fabrics, these wearable paintings could be worn as robes at the fair. The lucky recipients were encouraged to wear the ponchos while attending the fair. The gifted ponchos explored the status of the culture of art fairs, where being seen can be as important as seeing the art. Not limited to wearable art, Camille has also used hand-dyed fabrics to create abstract representations of abandoned billboards in Mexico City. Oleg, the New York-based crochet artist, has given a new meaning to what yarn bombing can be. She has created entire crochet environments and covered any number of large items with her brightly colored cozies, is what she calls them. They're like tea cozies, but bigger. <laughs> At first covering a car, and then taking on the ambitious task of covering a four-car locomotive. She did work with four assistants. Next, she got even more ambitious to make a cozy for homeless shelter in India by swaddling the entire building in a colorful knitted tapestry. This particular shelter offers temporary lodging to women who are down in their luck. To make the project a reality, Oleg spent weeks manning a large team of volunteers and knitted along the side of the local women. The finished colorful doilies depict flowers, butterflies, and elephants all stretched across the building's walls. Oleg's project calls attention to the way homelessness is woven into India's social fabric. The bright colors and designs are characteristic of the country's renowned textile industry, and the cheerful colors make it impossible for passerbys to overlook homelessness, a problem many people choose to ignore. Jonah Vasconcelos is without doubt the most internationally prominent Portuguese artist of her generation especially after her participation in the 2005 Venice Biennale, where she created a chandelier crafted of 25,000 tampons. Her studio work included bas-relief frame paintings using stuffed quilt-like pieces constructed in a quilt-like manner and pouring out of the frame. In 2012, Jonah was invited to show her work at the Contemporary Art Exhibit in the Palace of Versailles. 
Much of her work confronts feminism and concerns societal conventions by her use of techniques typically categorized as craft and associated with women. The artist also uses many materials from everyday life, such as household appliances, wall tiles, fabrics, medicine, urinals, pans, and plastic cutlery. Exploiting the narrative and emotional charge that these elements hold are release. Her sculptures are usually very large format works that sometimes have movement, sound, or lights and are characterized by their chromatic richness and exuberance. Gabriel Daw was born in Mexico City where he grew up surrounded by the intensity and color of Mexican culture. He now lives in Houston, Texas, where he moved for graduate school after living seven years in Canada. In search of creative freedom, he started experimenting, which eventually led him to explore textiles, activities traditionally associated with women and which were forbidden for a boy growing up in Mexico. As a child, he remembers his grandmother teaching his sister to embroider, but not him because he was a boy. Because of this, his work is subversive of notions of masculinity and machismo that are so ingrained in his culture. By working with thread, Dahl's work has evolved into creating large-scale installations using thread and creating indoor rainbows. No matter its locale, the stretch thread pieces conjure up the same effect. They dazzle with reflected light and send even the most casual passerby into pausing at their state of wonder. Few items symbolize masculine pomp and power quite like a necktie. Mikhail Cole has turned 27,000 of these potent strips of silk into a vast artwork, which is a silent embroidered scream against the global patriarchy as her entry into the 2017 Venice Biennale. The British-based artists utilized tens of thousands of men's ties and laboriously sewed them together to create a traditional gentleman's living room. The ties line the floor, the walls, the fireplace. They cover an overstuffed sofa, the stag's head on the wall, the mounted rifle, and even the pipe on the table. Some of the ties are over 60 years old. They are wedding ties, school ties, funeral ties. These ties have been seen in every celebration, every stage of human life. They've witnessed deals, they've been to prostitutes, they've been to pubs. For Cole, who was born in Israel, it's a direct comment on the oppression of women she feels in these simple items of clothing have come to symbolize from the pay gap in offices worldwide to men in political offices who can sign laws that affect women's bodies and livelihoods. The message of the work coincides with a crucial moment in the women's movement worldwide, which in Cole's mind was galvanized in the face of Trump's election. The American president's presence in Cole's room with a tie from Trump's own brand wrapped around the rifle. As well as commenting on the wider issues faced by women around the world today, this piece also comes from a deeply personal place for Cole. Her grandmother was a child bride, married off at 11, and gave birth at 12. Cole grew up in Israel and served her mandatory time in the military where sexual assault has long been an issue that's been swept under the table. Blankets are one of Marie Walt's, Watt's primary materials. She sees them as everyday objects 
that can carry extraordinary histories of use. In her tribe, she is an enrolled member of the Seneca Nation of Indians and in other indigenous communities. Blankets are given away to honor those who witness important events. She states, blankets receive infants into the world and shroud us when we die. I think of worn satin bindings, stains, and mended bits of ledger, like a ledger in the way they register dreams, child's play, intimacy, war, and celebratory moments in life. She started scavenging wool blankets from thrift floor stores in an attempt to construct totem and ladder sculptures. Others were labeled and given to her by friends. They were labeled with the stories that the blankets told. Watts noticed that people would respond to the work by associating their own memories of their own blankets. She likes the association between the blanket columns and sky and ground and the association to totems of the Pacific Northwest. She likes building a community to help her with hand stitching. She invites friends and neighbors and strangers to come over and stitch. Watts notice that when hands busy and eyes diverted, stories tend to flow. Her sewing circle invitation is the same today as it was several years ago. This is how she advertises it. No sewing experience necessary. I will feed you. I will trade a small artist-made silkscreen print in exchange for stitches. Come and go as you wish. All ages are welcome. Participants have ranged in age from 3 to 93. Shioto's famous thread installations are enhanced with personal items such as letters, shoes, keys, clothing, and furniture. The artist uses them to explore themes like home, birth, and death. She states about this installation called Within the Atrium, I have created a cloud of thoughts and connections binding the viewer to the past and present. The white yarn is timeless to me. Historic documents relating to the building where this was installed, early history, have been knotted into the fabric. The key in the hand, another piece by Shioto that represented Japan in the 2015 Venice Biennale, is probably her best known work containing these mysterious ships exploding a room of red thread with hanging keys. Uncertain Journey, the title of this work, consists of red wool forming a loose triangular shape. Shioto says she was deeply pained by the feeling of uncertainty regarding our path through life and wanted the installation to evoke that. Patrick Dougherty's work quickly evolved from single pieces sitting on a conventional pedestal to monumental scale environmental works. Over the last 30 years, he's built, built 230 of these works and become internationally acclaimed. His sculptures have been seen worldwide and all over the United States. Daugherty said that when he put down his briefcase and decided to express himself artistically, he first had to ask himself, what do I already know how to do? The answer was he knew the woods, the underbrush, and he knew how sticks like to stick to themselves by their inherent shape. So that's where he began. Daugherty describes his process as being that of looking inside oneself for what one knows intrinsically in the non-judgmental, childlike way that is so hard to come by as an adult. Unselfconsciously, but fully myself, 
That's the state of making I seek. The construction process has always included, by necessity, community involvement and the harvesting of truckloads of saplings. Integral to the process of building the sculpture is building a community within the volunteers. Toshika McAdam. In the mid-1990s, Japanese artist Toshika McAdam was showing a large-scale crochet work at an art gallery when two rambunctious children approached her and asked if the sculpture, resembling a colorful hammock, could be climbed on. She nervously agreed and watched cautiously as her suspended artwork twisted and stretched as the children climbed on top of it. Suddenly, an idea was born. Three years later, McAdam would open her first large-scale crocheted playground. She has since created numerous additional playscapes around Japan and in other countries. To create her earlier works, McAdam used a Japanese developed material called Vylalon, a durable product but inferior to the nylon she has later worked with, which she crochets and dyes herself in her studio in Bridgetown, Nova Scotia. McAdam's playscape structures are always entirely made by hand with only the addition of a few mechanical knotted elements, and not in every piece. Each work is original. Anila Kwayam Agha. Agha is a Palestinian American artist, having lived in the boundaries of different faiths, Islam and Christianity, and in cultures as different as Pakistan and the United States, Agha art is deeply influenced by the sense of alienation and transience that informs the migrant experience. She says, art saved my life. I make work about cultural and societal issues affecting women and patriarchal societies, and this allows me to have a voice I never had in Pakistan. Intersections is inspired by Aga's visit to Ahambra, an Islamic palace originally built in 889 in Granada, Spain. She was struck by the grandeur of the space and the fact that the construction was a collaboration of Islamic, Jewish, and Christian craftspeople working together. Agha reflected upon her childhood in Pakistan where culture dictated that women were excluded from the mosque, a place of creativity and community, and instead were told to pray at home. While living in Pakistan, she never entered a mosque. She translates these contradictory feelings into intersections, a contemplative space of her own making that is open to all. Her installation becomes an inclusive space where visitors of any color, gender, holding any opinion or belief can all feel welcome. The patterns resemble delicate lace. In the center of the room is a six and a half foot intricately laser cut cube in various lace-like patterns. Inside is a single intense 600 watt bulb that throws these various crisp shadows, changing the environment to resemble her imaginary mosque. The audience presence in the space becomes essential to experience it as a shared space. Toy plus shine is a London and Seoul-based architectural firm run by two principals, Jen Choi and Thomas Schein. The firm engages in institutional, commercial, residential, and art projects. 
the urchins created for Singapore's 2017 Marina Bay Festival are based on the textured surface of sea urchins shells. At night, the mysterious hovering and glowing large urchins create a sense of magic. When viewers enter into the urchins, they are surrounded by a single layer of glowing lacy surface where they experience the detail and texture of the urchins and see the city, the water, and the sky through this visual filter. When viewing the occupants from the outside, they become part of the artwork. The new patterns and motifs are created by Jen Choi and are hand crocheted by many volunteers who are credited individually for their contributions in all of the literature about their works. A single urchin is about 56 feet in size and weighs 220 pounds. The artist states, seeing hovering and glowing lacy objects against majestic skyscrapers and dark water would make anyone pause and gaze. This momentary pause of mundane and routine of our life would hopefully give us the opportunity to find the poetry around us. Arizona is located in Scottsdale, Arizona. During the day, the crocheted surface reflects, absorbs, and transmits sunlight. In the morning or late afternoon sun, the ribbons appear as glowing translucent objects. This piece was also hand crocheted in small pieces by volunteers from all over the U.S. who carefully follow the patterns developed by Jen Choi. The volunteers all posted their progress to social media, therefore sharing their work and communicating with other crocheters. I noted on their website is a call for other crochet volunteers for future projects, if anybody here is interested. <laughs> Bishop Butler states, I have always been drawn to portraits. I was a little girl who would sit next to my grandmother and ask her to go through old family albums. I was the one who wanted to hear all the stories that bored everybody else. This inquisitiveness has stayed with me to this day. Butler often starts her pieces with a black and white photo. Her stories are told through the fabric she selects the textures she combines, and the colors that create a whole new composition. Her portraits tell stories that many may have forgotten over time. She states, when you see vintage lace and aged satin, it tells you the story of a delicacy and refinement of times gone by. When you see African printed cloth and mud cloth, it tells the story of my ancestral homeland and the cradle of civilization. Casey Zavagilia. Casey was originally trained as a painter, but switched to embroidery 16 years ago in an attempt to establish a non-toxic workplace and create a body that referenced embroidery piece that she remembered making as a child growing up in Australia and totally enjoying the process. Her work focuses exclusively on portraits of friends, family, and fellow artists. The gaze of the subject toward the viewer has remained constant in her work. The work is all hand sewn using cotton and silk thread or cruel embroidery wool. From a distance, they read as hyper-realistic paintings. And only after closer inspection does the work true fabric construction show itself. A few years ago, Casey turned over one of her embroiders and for the first time saw the possibility of a new image and a path for her work that had been there all the time in her studio, but gone unnoticed. There was another portrait that was visible so different from the meticulously sewn front image. 
but perhaps more psychologically profound. The haphazard beauty found in this verso image created a haunting contrast to the front image and was a world of loose ends, knots, and chaos that she actually preferred. Tanabe Chukensai is a Japanese artist, and he's Tanabe Chukensai IV. Comes from a long, long line of master basket makers. He produces twisting installations of woven bamboo that meld into their environments, floor to ceiling. His artistic process begins when he selects and harvests the finest examples of tiger bamboo, which grow on one particular mountain in Japan. To bend the durable material, he first moistens each piece to achieve the perfect curve and often recycles the same pieces of bamboo for future installations. In 2017, the artist constructed a specific piece called Gate for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The work used tiger bamboo that had been used 10 times prior. He pushes the boundaries of bamboo art. He dramatically breaks the scale that we expect from this medium, with soaring, twisted, undulating forms stretching into the boundaries of space. His dramatic, immersive environments evoke bamboo forests where this work began their lives, and is very, very different than the tradition of Japanese basketry, which he grew up in. Tanabe describes his relationship to his materials in this way. In this day and age, we can see clearly, for the first time, the impact mankind has had on the natural world and the terrible environmental consequences which have followed. I was shocked to learn that since I was born in 1971, we as humans have managed to destroy one third of the flora and fauna existing at that time. As an artist, I consider it my duty to use my public art to call for a better balance between culture and nature. I am trying to encourage a conversation that will change the way we think and ask questions. So I hope I've raised a lot of questions, and I will go over them. Are you empowered by seeing more artists use textiles and textile techniques in their own artistic practice? What contributes to an artist being categorized as part of art or craft world? What role does the artist have in category placement? Why are we still discussing art versus craft? <laughs> Is there continued value in pondering art versus craft? Or will these two categories eventually emerge into one? I hope that I've raised questions that will stimulate further discussion. I wish I had clear answers to give to wrap up this talk, but I don't. I have some ideas, but no clear answers. And I'll be around for the rest of the afternoon and happy to continue this dialogue. I would stay here for an hour talking and listening to your ideas if I could, but they told me I can't. <laughs> so, so I'm going to stick to what I've been, the time I've been allotted. I would like to cl in closing, to thank Alice Rebick, which some of you may know. She's the Curator Emeritus of Textiles at the Denver Art Museum. And I want to thank her for her consultation and support of this lecture with a lot of dialogue and some good images. <laughs>